Irwin is the founding dean of UC, UCI Law School, uh, which when he founded, he proclaimed would be a, a top 20 law school within how many years? From the very beginning. From the very beginning. <laughs> uh, people wondered how possible that was, and lo and behold, he made it uh, true uh, almost immediately. Uh, he's taught constitutional law for some 25 years uh, at USC, Thank you. Duke. I like, I'm now at the age where when people underestimate that, <laughs> it sounds really good. <laughs> is it closer to 30? <laughs> That's okay. Go, going down is a good thing at this time. Right, John? Yeah. <laughs> he's the author of hundreds uh, of law review uh, articles and other articles and six books. Um, I hope I didn't underestimate that count. <laughs> Uh, and he's been uh, of significant uh, value to Los Angeles. Uh, he helped write the LA Charter. Uh, he was one of the uh, members of the panel investigating the Rampart scandal. Uh, and really most important to us, he's an incredible friend to the ACLU. Uh, generally, uh, every year, one of the highlights of the staff conference is we get a Section 1983 update from Irwin. Uh, and it's every year one of the highlights of that conference. Thank you. But in particular, he's been a, a real good friend of the ACLU of Southern California. Uh, so without any further ado, Thank Irwin. you. You're so sweet. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's really an honor and pleasure to get to do this with you. I thank you for coming on July 5th. I was worried when we chose this as the date. I said, would everybody be taking four-day weekends so that no one would be here? And so really appreciate your coming today. It's an amazing time in the United States Supreme Court. It's hard for me to think of any two years in the court where there have been so many blockbuster decisions. If there's any central theme that I would draw from the term that completed last week, is that what the Supreme Court does affects each of us, often in the most important and intimate aspects of our lives. On Wednesday a week ago, the Supreme Court dismissed the case concerning California's Proposition 8. And on Friday afternoon, same-sex couples began mirroring throughout California. The decision last week striking down Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act will mean that same-sex couples who are married in the 13 states that now allow it will have benefits under 1,100 federal statutes that previously were reserved only for heterosexual couples. The Supreme Court's decision last week will determine who gets into colleges and universities across the country. The Supreme Court's decision with regard to voting rights is going to mean that many discriminatory voting systems that otherwise would have been blocked will go into place. They'll not only decide who gets to vote and who doesn't, but who gets elected and who doesn't. The Supreme Court's decisions favoring business are going to make it much harder for victims of discrimination to sue, much harder for patients who are injured by generic drugs to sue. If you think about all of this, you can see how it really does affect all of us. A little bit about the term by the numbers. I would say overall they show that once more it was the Anthony Kennedy Court. Do you remember in June of 2012, Time Magazine had a cover with a picture of Anthony Kennedy and on the bottom were the words, the decider? That was especially true this year. Kennedy was in the majority this term more than any other justice, 91% of the time. Chief Justice Roberts was the runner-up at 86% of the time. But if you look at the non-unanimous decisions of the court, Kennedy was in the majority again the most, 83%, and there was 10 percentage points higher than the runner-up. But of course, you really see the effect of Anthony Kennedy by focusing on the 5-4 decisions. Those are usually, of course, the most important. This year, the Supreme Court decided 73 cases after briefing an oral argument, 23 were decided 5 to 4. That's significant in itself. About a third of the docket was decided 5 to 4. Justice Kennedy was in the majority by far more than any other justice in the 5 4 cases. He was in the majority in 20 of the 23 5 4 decisions. The runner up there was Justice Scalia, who was in the majority in 13 of the 5 4 decisions. I think then that you can get an overall glimpse of the ideology of the term by focusing on the five four cases that split along the traditional ideological lines. There were 16 cases this term where on the one side you had Roberts, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, and on the other Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. 
Kennedy was with the conservatives in 10 of those 16 and with the liberals in 6 of those 16. That's been true pretty much for all of the eight years that John Roberts has been Chief Justice. When the court splits ideologically 5-4, Kennedy is with the conservatives about 70% of the time and with the liberals about 30% of the time. I thought that what I would do is go through what I regard as some of the most important cases of the term. I'm glad if you want to interrupt me as I go along with questions, but I also promise to save a few minutes towards the end of our hour together for any questions or comments that you have. I want to start with the criminal procedure cases. I want to look at them in three sub-areas. The first sub-area is the Fourth Amendment. This was a big term for the Fourth Amendment in the Supreme Court. There are actually five Fourth Amendment cases. I picked the two that I think are the most important. I also think they're most significant because they tell us something more general about the Roberts Court in the Fourth Amendment. The first of these is Florida versus Jardin. Police in Florida got an anonymous tip through a Crime Stoppers hotline that there was marijuana growing in a house. A police officer with his drug-sniffing dog, Frankie, went onto the front porch of the house. When they got there, the canine gave the signal that such dogs give that drugs were present. Based on that, the police then went and got a warrant to search the house. They then found the marijuana growing operation. The question before the Supreme Court was whether it was a search under the Fourth Amendment for the police officer to go onto the front porch with the drug sniffing dog. The Supreme Court 5 to 4 said it was a search, and since there wasn't a warrant, then the evidence had to be excluded. An unusual split among the justices. Justice Scalia wrote the opinion for the court, joined by Justice Thomas, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan. Justice Scalia said that a trespass is sufficient for a search. This is what he had said a term before, a case called United States versus Jones, where the court found that placing a GPS device on a car was a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. Justice Scalia said placing the GPS device on the undercarriage of the car was a trespass. Since a trespass is sufficient for a search, and since there wasn't a valid warrant, there was a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Justice Alito wrote a strong dissent joined by the other justices. Justice Alito disagreed that going into somebody's front porch without consent is regarded as a trespass. Justice Alito said, Girl Scouts go onto the front porch of houses when they're going door to door to sell their cookies. Jehovah's Witnesses go onto front porches when they're going door to door to solicit money. UPS and FedEx goes onto the front porch to deliver packages. Just going onto somebody's front porch shouldn't be regarded as a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. I want to suggest to you that both the majority and the dissent miss what I think is the key point about this case in the Fourth Amendment. The real issue is, should people be able to keep secret what's going on within their house, at least until the police have a warrant and probable cause? Imagine that Frankie had been a super sniffing dog, and that from just standing on the public sidewalk outside the house, Frankie had been able to sniff and tell whether there was marijuana growing there. Under the reasoning of Justice Scalia, that wouldn't have been a search because there wasn't a trespass. But the same information is gathered. Shouldn't it be the same with regard to the Fourth Amendment? About 10 years ago, the court decided a case, Kylo versus the United States, which said pointing a thermal imaging device at a house to determine what's going on inside is a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. Is this really any different from that? The other case that I listed with regard to the Fourth Amendment, Maryland versus King, I think is the most important criminal procedure case of the term. Justice Alito said that he thought it's one of the most important Fourth Amendment cases to decide it in decades. Maryland has a law that if a person is arrested for a serious crime, DNA is taken from the individual. The DNA is obtained by a cotton swab inside the cheek. The DNA is not taken to link the person to the crime for which he or she has been arrested. The DNA is taken to see whether it matches for an unsolved crime in the police database. King was arrested for assault. He confessed to the police that he committed the assault. There were eyewitnesses. 
So taking the DNA from him had nothing to do with the crime for which he was arrested. But since assault is specified as a serious crime under the Maryland law, DNA was taken from him. It did match DNA from an unsolved rape. Based on the Maryland law, additional DNA was then taken from him, and that was used in his prosecution, and he was convicted. The question is, did taking DNA in this way violate the Fourth Amendment? The Supreme Court 5 to 4 said it did not violate the Fourth Amendment. Here, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court. It was joined by Chief Justice Roberts. Justice Thomas also joins the opinion. Justice Kennedy writes the opinion. Justice Breyer joins the opinion, and Justice Alito joins. So what you've got is a majority, which is unusual, in that you have in the majority Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, and Breyer, with Kennedy writing for the court. Justice Kennedy says that the test under the Fourth Amendment is reasonableness. Reasonableness is assessed by balancing the law enforcement needs against the intrusion on privacy. Justice Kennedy said the law enforcement needs here are great. The benefit to law enforcement is being able to solve unsolved crimes. He says the intrusion on privacy is minimal. It's a cotton swab inside somebody's cheek. He said we already take fingerprints and photographs from those arrested. Taking DNA is no different. Justice Scalia writes a vehement dissent joined by Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. So notice Scalia, in both this and the prior case, is on the criminal defendant side. Breyer is on law enforcement side in both of these cases. My explanation for that is that Justice Scalia wants bright line rules. It's a trespass, it's a search, it's not a trespass, it's not a search. And we'll talk about the bright line rule in this case. Justice Breyer is a justice who believes in balancing. And so he's very inclined towards the approach that Justice Kennedy takes in the majority, saying when you balance law enforcement needs against intrusion on privacy, it doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. Justice Scalia in dissent says that this is one of the only times in American history that the Supreme Court has approved searching a person for a crime for which he or she is not a suspect. There's no individualized suspicion here. He said, this is akin to the old general warrants that were used in England that are not allowed. Maryland's explicit. It's not using the DNA for the crime for which a person is a suspect. He says to search somebody when they're not a suspect violates the Fourth Amendment. He very much disagrees with Justice Kennedy's analogy to fingerprinting or photographing. He says, fingerprints are taken when a person is arrested for identification's sake to see if the person really is the name that the person has given to the police. He says DNA isn't used for that purpose. It takes too long to get DNA test back. He says DNA is taken entirely to link a person to other crimes. And he says also with regard to privacy, the intrusion is much greater. A tremendous amount can be learned from somebody from his or her DNA. What can be learned is exponentially increasing each year. Again, I think the mistake of the majority is not focusing on the informational privacy aspect of the case, which is what Justice Scalia discusses. The, the key answered their questions. And then the officer said, if we do an analysis of the shells and casings from the murder scene and your shotgun, will they match? At that point, he was silent. He didn't answer the question. When he was prosecuted for the murders, the prosecutor pointed to his silence in response to the questions and said that the jury should draw an adverse inference from his silence and use that as evidence of guilt. Salinas was convicted. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The question before the Supreme Court was whether or not his Fifth Amendment rights were violated. Five to four, the Supreme Court said his Fifth Amendment rights were not violated. There was no majority opinion for the court. Justice Alito wrote the plurality opinion that was joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy. Justice Alito said that he never invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Salinas never said to the police that he wanted to remain silent. And Justice Alito said, since he didn't invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, therefore, it wasn't violated by asking the jury to draw a negative inference from his silence. Justice Thomas wrote an opinion 
concurring in the judgment joined by Justice Scalia. Justice Thomas said prosecutors should always be able to ask juries to draw negative inferences from silence by a defendant. In Griffin v. California in 1965, the Supreme Court said that prosecutors cannot ask juries to draw negative inference from a defendant's silence at a criminal trial. The Supreme Court said if a jury can draw a negative inference from someone remaining silent, that really punishes the person who exercises the privilege against self-incrimination. Justice Thomas said Griffin was wrong and should be overruled. Justice Thomas said the Fifth Amendment says nobody can be compelled to be a witness against himself or herself. Drawing a negative inference from silence isn't compelling somebody to be a witness, so it doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment. Justice Breyer wrote for the four dissenters. Justice Breyer said, we've never asked that a defendant utter magic words or meet a specific formula in order to invoke the privilege against self-incrimination. This is pre-arrest. This is before the person is even advised of the right to remain silent. How likely is it that people are going to know they have the right to remain silent? Even more important, how likely is it that somebody who's talking to the police will know that they need to specifically say the magic words, I wish to remain silent, in order for that right to be invoked? Justice Breyer said, didn't Salinas invoke his right to remain silent in the most basic and obvious way? He was silent, and shouldn't that be enough? So for any of you who represent or will represent criminal defendants, it's so important that you advise your clients that from the beginning, if they wish to invoke their right to remain silent, they have to specifically say so. Anything less is not sufficient. Finally, one other case that will be very important for those practicing in federal court is a case called Aline versus the United States. It involves the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial. In 2000, in Apprendi versus New Jersey, the Supreme Court said that any factor other than a prior conviction that leads to a sentence greater than the statutory maximum has to be proven to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. In 2002, in Harris versus the United States, the Supreme Court said that doesn't apply with regard to mandatory minimum sentences. So Harris and Aline both involve the same federal statute. It says if a person possesses a weapon while committing a felony, there's a mandatory minimum sentence of five years in prison. If the person brandishes the weapon, it's a mandatory minimum sentence of seven years in prison. And if the person uses the weapon, it's a mandatory minimum sentence of 10 years in prison. And the question in both Harris and Alina is, does brandishing have to be proven to the jury beyond a reasonable doubt? Or can the judge just find it as a sentencing factor by preponderance of the evidence? In Harris, the court said, it's just a sentencing factor. The judge can find it by preponderance of the evidence. In a lien, the Supreme Court expressly overruled Harris. In a really unusual split among the justices. Justice Thomas wrote the opinion for the court, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. You don't see that split among the justices all the time. <laughs> Justice Thomas said, there's no logical distinction between the principle of Apprendi in a mandatory minimum sentencing scheme. It's the facts that trigger the mandatory minimum that leads to the sentence. Under the reasoning of Apprendi, that should be the jury beyond a reasonable doubt. What explains the Supreme Court shift between Harris in 2002 and Aline in 2013? One thing, <coughs> Stephen Breyer changed his mind. Breyer had dissented in Apprendi and he was in the majority in Harris, and he wrote a short opinion here saying, I think Apprendi was wrong, and I'm not going to vote to extend Apprendi. Now Breyer is in the majority of rural Harris, and he writes a short opinion saying, I didn't join in, I joined in Harris, I did not want to extend Apprendi, because I thought Apprendi was wrong. But now I realize that Apprendi is the law, and we have to live with it, and if Apprendi is the law, I can't distinguish it from a mandatory minimum sentencing scheme. But since there are a number of important federal statutes, as well as state laws, with mandatory minimums, this increases the burden on the prosecutor. It has to be shown beyond a reasonable doubt and proven to the jury that the facts that trigger the mandatory minimum have been met. The second major category of cases I listed concerns civil procedure. 
have listed three cases here. The first of these is Kyobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum. And if some of you had worked on this case, it involves the Federal Alien Tort Statute. The Alien Tort Statute was adopted in 1789. It creates federal court jurisdiction to hear suits by non-United States citizens in violation of torts in violation of the law of nations. Most international human rights litigation in federal courts for the last several decades have been under the Alien Tort Statute. This case involves the activities of Royal Dutch Petroleum. We know them in this country best by their subsidiary, Shell Oil, but it is a non-United States company. And the allegations of the complaint are that it conspired with the Nigerian government in egregious human rights violations, including killings and torture. If you ever read the novelist Richard North Patterson, he wrote a novel about the activities of Royal Dutch Petroleum in Nigeria, and it's called Eclipse, and it tells in quite graphic detail what Royal Dutch Petroleum is alleged to have done. Esther Kyobel was a native of Nigeria. She alleges that her husband was murdered because of the activities of Royal Dutch Petroleum. She now lives in New York. Other plaintiffs who now live in New York who suffered the human rights violations in Nigeria brought the lawsuit. The Supreme Court ruled that the alien tort statute could not be used in this instance. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for the court. His opinion was joined by Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Chief Justice Roberts said, there's a presumption against the extraterritorial application of federal statutes. He said that should apply to a jurisdictional statute like this, as well as to a substantive statute. He said that Congress has not sufficiently indicated that it wanted the statute to apply extraterritorially in a situation like this. He said this is a non-United States company being sued for its activities in a foreign country, affecting non-United States nationals, the presumption against extraterritorial application controls. Just as Breyer strongly disagreed, he said the whole point of the alien tort statute was for extraterritorial application. If it's a tort in the United States against somebody in the United States, you don't need a statute to create a special cause of action. The obvious application of this would be extraterritorially. If you read the media accounts after this came down, or read on the blogs, you saw corporations and their lawyers proclaiming that this was the end of alien tort statute litigation. I think that this prediction of the end of alien tort statute litigation is premature. In part four of his majority opinion, Chief Justice Roberts said, there may be instances where the connections to the United States are great enough to overcome the presumption against extraterritoriality. Justice Kennedy, one of the five in the majority, wrote a short, enigmatic, concurring opinion in which said there's many questions left answered, including this one. Imagine it's a United States company engaged in human rights violations in a foreign country. I think that's a very different situation than Kyobel, and I think that's the situation where the Alien Tort Statute will remain available. That's now being litigated in many federal district courts around the country. But there's no doubt that even on its own terms, Kyobel is an enormous blow to litigation with regard to international human rights. The second case is also a very troubling one. It's Clapper versus Amnesty International. A few years ago, Congress amended the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to make it easier for the National Security Agency and federal agencies to intercept the communications between those in the United States and selected foreign countries. This is the ability to listen into conversations and to read email. A lawsuit is brought by Amnesty International, represented by the ACLU, arguing that this violates the First Amendment rights of the plaintiffs. Plaintiffs included lawyers who regularly represent clients in countries from which the communications are intercepted. The lawyers said that they're required by their profession to scrupulously protect the attorney-client privilege. And as a result, they can no longer have phone conversations or email conversations with their clients because of the fear that they might be intercepted. If they want to talk to their clients, they now have to fly halfway around the world. Plaintiffs included journalists who regularly talk to sources in these countries were saying they can no longer do so for fear that the government's going to accept the communications. It included business people who say they can no longer have deals and communications that 
required for them with people in these countries. And the question is, do these plaintiffs have standing to be able to sue in federal court? The United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit said yes. The Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision reversed and held that there was no standing. Justice Alito wrote the opinion for the court, joined by Robert Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas. Justice Alito said that none of the plaintiffs can show that his or her communications were intercepted by the National Security Agency. That's because the NSA doesn't tell people when it's intercepting their communications. As a result, none of the plaintiffs can show that he or she is personally injured. Now, the plaintiff's argument was that their speech and communication is chilled and that that's a sufficient injury to meet the requirements for standing. Justice Alito, at the end of his opinion, expressly rejected that argument. He invoked a decision from 40 years ago, Laird versus Tatum, where the Supreme Court said that the plaintiffs didn't have standing and couldn't bring a challenge to the army spying on civilian groups that chilling of speech isn't enough an injury for standing. That just seems to be wrong in terms of the First Amendment. If speech is a fundamental right, as the Supreme Court has said, then a government action that was likely to tangibly chill it should be sufficient for standing. But the Supreme Court says no, five to four. In the final case that I would mention in this category came down two weeks ago. It's American Express versus Italian Colors Restaurant. Italian Colors is a small restaurant. It takes American Express cards. As part of taking American Express cards, it has to pay American Express the fee that it charges. It and other small restaurants and businesses believed that American Express was violating antitrust laws with the fee that it was charging. The fee to these businesses for American Express was twice that for other cards. It wanted to bring an antitrust suit against American Express. As part of the agreement between these businesses and American Express, there was a clause that said that if they had any dispute with American Express, it would have to go to arbitration, and it would have to be individual arbitration. It couldn't be class-wide arbitration. Well, if Italian Colors won in its antitrust claim, its maximum damages would be $38,000. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars to succeed in an antitrust claim. So Italian Colors Restaurant says that if it's required to go to individual arbitration of its antitrust claim, it simply can't do so. No one will be able to do so. So therefore, it should be able to bring a class action suit against American Express. The Supreme Court ruled five to four in favor of American Express, saying that Italian Colors Restaurant had to go to arbitration. It had to be individual arbitration. It couldn't be class-wide arbitration. Scalia wrote the opinion for the court here, joined by Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Justice Scalia said, the contract has an arbitration clause. The Federal Arbitration Act requires that we enforce it. He said, no, it's true that it may not be able to go forward, but that isn't a basis for an escape from the arbitration clause that they agreed to. Justice Kagan wrote a terrific dissent. She said, here's what the court's saying. A company can violate the federal antitrust law and then immunize itself from any liability just by putting in a clause that says that there has to be individual arbitration. And she says, you know what the majority's response to that is? Too darn bad. This follows very much from a Supreme Court decision from two years ago in AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. In fact, Justice Scalia, at the end of his opinion in American Express versus Town Color, says it follows from AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. That case involved the Concepcions who saw an ad that AT&T was giving away free cell phones. They each went and got their cell phones, and then they were surprised to see that they were each charged $30.22, the first statement for them. So they wanted to join a class action against AT&T for fraud. AT&T said, when you signed your cell phone agreement, if you had read it, you would have seen there was a clause that any dispute arising out of the cell phone, you had to go to arbitration, and it had to be individual arbitration. The California Supreme Court in the Discovered Bank case had said that arbitration clauses in routine consumer contracts are not enforceable. The California Supreme Court said they're contracts of adhesion. The Supreme Court, five to four, said that the arbitration clause had to be enforced. Justice Scalia wrote, joined by the same justices, and he talked about the interim effects 
of class actions on business and the need to protect business from class actions. Now, the reality is no one's going to sue or go to arbitration for $30.22. Where class actions are so important to situations like this, where a large number of people are each losing a small amount of money. To bar class actions, to give enormous protection to corporations in those situations. And this is so important to each of us as consumers, employees, and patients, as well as lawyers. Arbitration clauses are increasingly ubiquitous. I went to see a new eye doctor that not long ago, and I was given a big stack of forms to fill out. And in the middle was a page where I was asked to sign that if any dispute with the doctor arising out of the treatment, I would have to go to arbitration. I couldn't go to court. And I asked the receptionist, would the doctor still see me if I didn't sign the form? And she said she didn't know. Nobody had ever asked the question before. <laughs> and around the same time, I got a new computer. And if you know, notice, whenever you turn on a computer or an iPad for the first time, you have to click that you've read the terms and agree to them. I'm sure that I'm like all of you. I just click agree and use the machine. I never read the terms. <laughs> well, in this instance, I decided to read the terms. And sure enough, there was a clause, I think I remember it was paragraph 8, that said that if any dispute with Dell arising out of the use of the computer, I agreed I'd go to arbitration. I couldn't go to court. I wrote Dell a letter saying I did not agree to Clause 8, that I'd have to go to arbitration. And by opening the envelope of my letter, they agreed that I could sue them in court if we had any dispute. They never wrote back. But this case is enormously important when you put it together with AT&T Mobility vs. Concepcion in favoring business, because business gets to dictate the terms in these contracts of adhesion. They can put in an arbitration clause. They can require that it be individual arbitration. And then that bars class action suits in all of the instances where the only realistic remedy is through a class action suit. The third major area I list that concerns the First Amendment, this was not a big term before the court with regard to the First Amendment. For next term, there are already some major First Amendment cases before them. But this term, there was only one First Amendment case. There were no religion cases, and it was a speech case. And it was the U.S. Agency for International Development versus Open Society Foundation. Congress passed a law that said that if entities receive money with regard to HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment, they must adopt a policy condemning human trafficking and prostitution. The Open Society Foundation brought a challenge to this. They said, obviously, they oppose human traffic and prostitution, but they're around the world providing services to people. And they worried that it would hurt them in dealing with some patients and clients if they had this official policy condemning what their patients and clients were doing. And so they brought a challenge that this violated the First Amendment. The Supreme Court, a couple of weeks ago, in a 7-2 to two decision, declared that this violated the First Amendment. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for the court. Only Justices Scalia and Thomas dissented. If you've studied free speech law, you know there are few areas more confused than the unconstitutional condition doctrine. When is it an unconstitutional condition for the government to condition federal funds or for state, local government, state or local money on having to give up certain speech rights? The key case that is used by the government is one you might remember from 1991, Rust versus Sullivan. Rust versus Sullivan says that any entity that takes federal Planned Parenthood money cannot engage in abortion counseling and referrals. And the Supreme Court, five to four, upheld that and said it was not an impermissible unconstitutional condition. Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the court in this case, distinguishes Rust versus Sullivan. He says there's a difference when the government is the speaker, like in Rust versus Sullivan, versus when the government is forcing recipients of federal money to adopt a policy. So the latter violates the First Amendment. Now, I can articulate the distinction, but why in Rust versus Sullivan should we think of it as the government is the speaker? The government was saying that agencies, organizations that get federal Planned Parenthood money can't do abortion counseling referrals. Those are private entities, private doctors. Why is it that the court says now it was the government was the speaker, but in this instance, the government was not the speaker? I think this is an important case from a First Amendment perspective. It limits the government's ability to force people to adopt policies in exchange for federal funds, but I don't think it adds very much clarity to the law. 
The fourth area that I listed concerns employment discrimination. And there were two decisions a week ago Monday that strongly favor employers over employees in discrimination suits. The first of these is Vance versus Ball State. The Supreme Court, in a couple of cases about 15 years ago, Farragher and Ellith, dealt with sexual harassment and said, if an employer is going to be held liable for sexual harassment, a distinction has to be drawn between sexual harassment by fellow employees versus sexual harassment by supervisors. If it's sexual harassment by coworkers, then the employer can be held liable only if it can be shown that the employer was negligent in controlling the workplace. But if it's sexual harassment by a supervisor, generally the employer is strictly liable. So if you think about it in just practical terms, it is far easier for a plaintiff to win under strict liability than having to prove negligence. So it's in the employee's interest to try to argue that the harasser was a supervisor, whereas business wants to argue that the harassment was done by a fellow employee, a coworker. In Vance versus Ball State, the Supreme Court adopted a very narrow definition of who's a supervisor. Justice Alito wrote, joined by the other four conservative justices, and he said, a person is a supervisor only if that individual is empowered by the employee employer take tangible adverse employment actions, hiring, firing, demotion, cutting salary. To make clear what this means in a concrete way, imagine a law firm. Imagine that there's a senior associate who's responsible for overseeing the work of a junior associate on a day-to-day -day basis. Literally, practical sense, supervising everything that she's doing. And imagine that the junior associate accuses the senior associate of sexual harassment. Under this case, that senior associate is not a supervisor because the senior associate almost surely doesn't have the ability to hire, fire, demote, cut the pay. Only the firm can do that. In fact, even imagine it's a partner in the law firm who's sexually harassing an associate within the firm. The partner, on his own, likely does not have the ability to hire, fire, demote, or cut the salary. That requires a firm decision. So that partner is no longer a supervisor, which means in these instances that the employee, the victim of the sexual harassment, can recover only by proving that the law firm was negligent in controlling. And negligent is obviously a much harder standard to meet. The other case is the Texas Southwest Medical Center versus Nasser. In all areas of employment discrimination, race discrimination, gender discrimination, religion discrimination, <coughs> disability discrimination, the plaintiff only has to prove that the prohibited type of activity was one of many motivating factors. The plaintiff doesn't have to prove, say, she gets fired, that gender was the but-for cause of her being fired just has to show that gender was one of many of the factors. If somebody's claiming that they didn't get hired because of a disability, they don't have to prove that the disability was the but-for cause for the person not getting hired, enough to show that the disability was one of many motivating factors. It is far easier to prove that something is one of many factors than that something is the but-for cause. And the Supreme Court has prescribed a whole method of analysis in these so-called mixed motive cases where race or gender or religion or sexual orientation is shown to be one of many factors. The question is, if somebody is bringing a claim for retaliation, is it enough to show that the retaliation was one of many factors? Or do they have to show that retaliation was the but-for cause of the adverse employment action? This case involves somebody who complains of race discrimination and then gets fired. Is it enough that the person shows that the claim of race discrimination, the retaliation, was one of the factors that led to this? Or does the person have to prove that the but-for cause of the firing was retaliation? And the Supreme Court ruled that in a retaliation case, the plaintiff has to show that the retaliation was the but-for cause of the adverse employment action. Justice Kennedy wrote here, joined by the other conservative justices. And so 
If somebody wants to say, I complained of not being treated the same because of my disability, and then I got fired or demoted, they have to show the but-for cause for the firing or demotion was in retaliation. It's a much heavier burden to meet. You know what's going to happen from a practical perspective. The employer is going to come forward and say, you know, the person was late for work a lot. Or, you know, the person's work was sloppy recently. And so this wasn't the but-for cause for the person being fired. I think it means that a lot more of these cases are going to be resolved on summary judgment in favor of the employer rather than ever getting to the jury, which obviously is what plaintiffs want. Um, Justice Ginsburg wrote terrific dissents in both of these cases, talking about in each instance what the court is doing is undermining the goal of Congress of protecting people from discrimination. And she urged Congress to amend the employment discrimination laws to correct this. Of course, in theory, Congress could amend the employment discrimination laws to correct this. Hard to believe that could get through at least this House of Representatives. The final area that I listed are, of course, the most high profile cases of the term, those dealing with equality. And I subdivided this into race and marriage. The first of the cases is Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. In June of 2003, in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court said that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body, that college universities may use race as one factor among many in admission decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. In 2004, the regents of the University of California realized that their student body was less diverse than it had been in 1996. There were fewer African American students at the University of Texas in 2004 than it had been in 1996. There was only a small increase in the number of Latino students, despite a very large increase in the Latino population in Texas during that interval. So the regents of the University of Texas did exactly what it seemed that Grutter prescribed. They said they would take 75% of the entering class by taking the top 10% of high schools across the state. Texas is sufficiently racially segregated that that produces some diversity. But then they said for the other 25%, for each applicant, they would calculate an admission score. The admission score was the sum of two numbers. One was called the Academic Achievement Index. That was the student's grades and test scores. The other was a Personal Achievement Index, which was arrived at by grading two essays required in the application for admission and looking at six factors, one of which was diversity. So it truly was using race as one among many factors in the decision-making process. Abigail Fisher applied for the University of Texas in 2008. She was rejected. She enrolled in Louisiana State University, from which she graduated in 2012. She brought a lawsuit challenging the University of Texas Affirmative Action Plan. The Federal District Court rejected her challenge and upheld the plan. The Fifth Circuit affirmed. The Supreme Court granted review. I think I can convince all of you in about 30 seconds that the Supreme Court had absolutely no jurisdiction to hear this case. <laughs> Abigail Fisher admitted to the court she no longer has a claim for injunctive or declaratory relief. She graduated from the University, uh, Louisiana State University in May of 2012 and she has no desire to go back to college. So her only remaining claim, and she's agreed to this for the Supreme Court, is $100 in money damages. That's her application fee and her housing deposit. The defendants in the lawsuit, and you look up the complaint online, are the University of Texas and the regents of the University of Texas in their official capacity. The law is absolutely clear under the 11th Amendment that a state and state official in their official capacity cannot be sued for money damages. The case is barred by the 11th Amendment. There's no argument on the other side. Also, there's a real question as to why she'd have standing. Her injury has to be caused by the policy she's challenging. Her injury at this point is the $100 that she says she lost. She would have applied to the University of Texas even if it didn't have an affirmative action plan. So she can't show that that injury is caused by the plan. The court didn't mention this at all. Many, including me, feared that this was going to be the case where the Supreme Court overruled or significantly cut back on Grutter. I think there are four votes on the court, Roberts, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, to overrule Grutter. So I and all who care about diversity breathed a huge sigh of relief a week ago Monday when the Supreme Court did not overrule Grutter. It did not significantly cut back on Grutter. 
Justice Kennedy wrote for the court. It was seven to one. Only Justice Ginsburg dissented. Justice Kagan was recused. Justice Kennedy said, the court is not reconsidering Grutter. The court was not reconsidering that college and universities have a compelling interest in a diverse student body. And the court did not reconsider that college and universities can use race as one factor in money and admission decisions to benefit minorities. However, Justice Kennedy said, in order for a college or university to use race as a factor in admission decisions, it has to prove that there's no race-neutral alternative that can achieve diversity. Justice Kennedy said that the University of Texas has not adequately demonstrated that there's no race-neutral alternative that can achieve diversity. The court remanded the case to the Fifth Circuit for that determination. I do think that the case in tone makes affirmative action programs more difficult, that now the court has clarified what strict scrutiny means in this context. The college or university that wants to use race has to prove there's no race-neutral alternative that can achieve diversity. What will this mean in practice? What exactly has to be shown that the court doesn't specify? The reality is that because of the legacy of discrimination and continuing inequalities in education, there'll be very little diversity in law schools or medical schools or elite colleges without affirmative action at this point in time. The reality is that colleges and universities use race in order to achieve diversity because there isn't an alternative that can be used to be able to generate diversity. We've seen that here in California. If you've read the stories in the Los Angeles Times just in the last week, the fact that the University of California system has not been able to come up with race-neutral alternatives to even get diversity back to what it was in 1996 before Prop 209 was adopted here. But what will the courts require in terms of proof after this case? That we don't know. And also, how much will this case lead others to bring challenges to affirmative action plans across the country? That's what we have to see. The next day, Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder came down. And it is an enormous setback for civil rights. I think that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is one of the most important federal laws adopted in my lifetime. Section 2 of the Act prohibits state and local governments from election systems or practices that have a racially discriminatory impact against minority voters. It authorizes lawsuits to challenge state and local governments if they're alleged to violate Section 2. But Congress knew that wouldn't be enough. Litigation is enormously expensive and time-consuming. Congress had seen how especially southern states kept changing their election systems to disenfranchise minority voters. So Congress added Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. It says, as for jurisdictions that have a history of race discrimination in voting, they can have a significant change in their election system only if they get pre-approval, pre-clearance from the Attorney General, or from a three-judge federal court in Washington, D.C. Section 4, and especially Section 4B of the Act, determines what those jurisdictions are that need preclearance, and it's now nine states and many localities throughout the country. This expired in 1982. Congress extended it then for another 25 years. There was a challenge to its constitutionality, and the Supreme Court upheld it. It was scheduled then to expire again in 2007. In 2006, Congress held 12 hearings over an 11-month period. It produced a record that was 15,000 pages long, documenting continuing race discrimination in voting. The legislative record shows 650 instances in which the Attorney General, between 1982 and 2006, denied preclearance to changes in election systems in the covered jurisdictions. How many thousands of other instances were there where the state or local government didn't even try because they knew they wouldn't get preclearance? The vote in Congress was almost unanimous to extend Section 5 for another 25 years. The vote in the Senate was 98 to nothing. There were only 33 no votes in the House of Representatives. President George W. Bush signed it into law. Shelby County, Alabama is south of Selma, Selma Alabama. It's a jurisdiction with a long history of race discrimination in a state with a long history of race discrimination in voting. Alabama is a covered jurisdiction under Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act. A week ago Tuesday, the Supreme Court, 5 to 4, declared Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act to be unconstitutional.
Chief Justice Roberts wrote, joined by Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Chief Justice Roberts said that the formula in Section 4B of the Act is based on data from the 1960s and the 1970s. Congress didn't change the formula when it extended the law in 2006. He says, this is a tremendous intrusion onto state and local sovereignty. He said, this is forcing covered jurisdictions, I'll quote his word, to beseech the Attorney General for permission to change their election systems. He said, this therefore exceeds Congress' authority to remedy discrimination. It violates the Tenth Amendment. Justice Ginsburg once more wrote a vehement dissent. And she said, this is really about who should decide what remedies are needed and who should they apply to. Should it be the court or Congress? She said, Congress has special powers under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, Section 2 of the 15th Amendment, to provide remedies, and we should defer to Congress. I find the irony of this case, to just skip ahead for a moment, to be found in Justice Scalia's decision, his dissent specifically, the next day in United States versus Windsor, where the court five to four struck down Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. Justice Scalia writes this angry, vehement dissent talking about the need to defer to Congress, how Congress passed the Defense of Marriage Act. He talks about the vote in Congress and all this. Well, all four of the dissenters in Windsor, Robert Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, emphasize the need to defer to Congress. For these four justices, where was their belief in deference to Congress when they're striking down the extension of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which I say was based on a voluminous legislative history documenting the continued need for the statute? In theory, Congress could repass Section 4B with a different formula as to what jurisdictions are covered based on current data. If you believe there is the slightest chance that Congress will ever do this, I have a bridge I want to sell you. Um, <laughs> Besides the fact that, again, this Congress isn't likely to do it, in order for Congress to do that, they would have to come to agreement as to which among their jurisdictions are going to need to get preclearance. I don't see any way that Congress is going to ever come to agreement as to what the new formula is. Section 5 depends on there being a Section 4B. Jurisdictions that need to get preclearance are those that are specified in Section 4. Once Section 4 is gone, Section 5 is rendered a nullity. This is a huge setback for voting rights. What we've already begun to see, we've seen it in Texas to start with, is jurisdictions that had their plans denied preclearance are now simply reinstituting them and saying, OK, you don't like it, sue us. And so the very plans that were rejected for being discriminatory are now being put into place. Finally, with regard to the marriage cases, they came down, of course, a week ago Wednesday. United States versus Windsor involves Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, federal law that says, for purposes of federal law, including federal taxes and federal benefits, marriage has to be between a man and a woman. Edith Windsor and her longtime partner, Thea Sprayer, went to Canada to get married. They live in New York, where, among other things, they own a home. When Thea Sprayer passed away, all of her property went to Edith Windsor. If the federal government had recognized their marriage, which New York does, then Edith Windsor wouldn't owe any estate taxes. The property would just become hers. But because of Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, federal taxes and federal benefits don't recognize their marriage, and Edith Windsor was charged $363,000 in estate taxes. She brought a challenge to Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. The Supreme Court, 5 to 4, declared Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional. Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court, joined by Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. If you've had constitutional law and you've read Anthony Kennedy opinions, there should be nothing surprising in this one. Since coming on the court in 1987, Justice Kennedy has always been an advocate of states' rights. And here he talks about federalism. He says marriage has traditionally been defined by the states. He says, therefore, the federal government needs to have a very good reason for overturning the choice of New York to recognize the same-sex marriage of Windsor and Sprayer. And then he went on to talk about Congress's rationale here. Including this case, there have been three in all of American history expanding rights for gays and lesbians. Romer v. Evans in 1996, Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, and now United States v. Windsor. And you know who wrote all three of those Supreme Court opinions? Anthony Kennedy. Justice Kennedy here said, 
Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act was based on animus against gays and lesbians. Congress expressed that the reason that it was adopting this was condemning homosexual activity. In fact, if you listen to the tape of the oral argument, there was a very dramatic moment on the Wednesday when this was being argued where Justice Kagan read from the legislative history where Congress said the reason it was adopting this was to condemn homosexual activity. Justice Kennedy said, such animus is not sufficient to meet equal protection, and the court struck down Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. Now, for those of you who had equal protection law, you'd know that the United States here and some of the amicus were urging the Supreme Court to adopt heightened scrutiny for sexual orientation discrimination. The court didn't do that. Much like in Romer and Lawrence, the court struck down the law without indicating the level of scrutiny, in essence saying it doesn't even meet rational basis review. There were three dissenting opinions. Um, Chief Justice Roberts seemed to try to write a mild dissent, saying, can't we all get along, but still might uphold Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. Justice Scalia wrote, even for him, a very angry and vehement dissent. <laughs> and as I was reading, I was saying, why is he so angry? And then as you get to the end of the dissent, you see exactly. He says, you know, there's really no distinction between the reasons that the majority gave for striking down Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act and the reasons it would have to give if there was a challenge to a state law prohibiting same-sex marriage. He said, we're just waiting for the other shoe to drop now where the court's going to start striking down the state laws that prohibit same-sex marriage. And I think Scalia is absolutely right here. I think that it is now just a matter of time. I know that the focus on federalism and Kennedy's opinion means that it's just about Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, but I think he's saying that this violates equal protection this is just based on animus indicates that there are well, surely on this court five votes to strike down state laws that prohibit marriage equality for gays and lesbians and just a question of how long it'll be to get to the Supreme Court. Um, that leads me to the last case, Hollingsworth versus Perry. It of course involves the challenge to California's Proposition 8. In May of 2008, the California Supreme Court interpreted the California Constitution to create a right of marriage equality for gays and lesbians. In November of 2008, the California voters passed an initiative, Proposition 8, to amend the state constitution to say that in California, marriage had to be between a man and a woman. Two same-sex couples brought a challenge in federal district court in San Francisco, arguing that Proposition 8 was unconstitutional. In the summer of 2010, federal district court judge Vaughn Walker declared Proposition 8 unconstitutional as denying equal protection and violating the right to marry for gays and lesbians. He issued an injunction against the governor, the attorney general, the state registrar of records, and all under their direction and control, keeping them from enforcing Prop 8 anywhere in California. The defendants announced that they were not going to appeal Judge Walker's ruling. The supporters of the initiative, though, came forward and said, we want to appeal to defend the ruling, to defend Prop 8. After briefing and oral argument, the Ninth Circuit certified the question to the California Supreme Court as whether the supporters of an initiative would be able to represent the interests of the state in defending an initiative when government officials refused to do so. The California Supreme Court unanimously said that the supporters of an initiative could represent the interests of the state, the Ninth Circuit in February of 2012 then said there was standing and declared Prop 8 unconstitutional. The Supreme Court, 5 to 4, dismissed the challenge to Prop 8 on standing grounds. Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia were in the majority, joined by Justice Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan. Now, I'll always wonder, did Roberts and or Scalia vote to dismiss based on standing because they knew that if either of them had voted for standing, there'd be five votes for the court to hear the case, and then likely five votes to strike down Prop 8, Kennedy, Ginsburg, Breyer, Senator Mary Kagan, and this was a way of forestalling that. I wonder if Justice Ginsburg was not the architect of the liberals deciding to dismiss on standing grounds. Justice Ginsburg is very much a proceduralist, also, Justice Ginsburg wrote an opinion in a case called Arizonans for Official English where she said that supporters of an initiative don't have standing to be able to sue to defend it if government officials won't do so. But Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the court, says in order to have standing to sue or to appeal, somebody has to be injured. He said the supporters of the initiative aren't injured if it's enjoined. 
their only harm is an ideological one, and an ideological injury is never sufficient for standing. As you know, on Friday of last week, the Ninth Circuit lifted its stay of Judge Walker's ruling. Same-sex couples immediately began to be married in California. The supporters of Prop 8 went to Justice Kennedy on Saturday and asked him to reinstitute the stay. On Sunday around noon Eastern time, he refused to reinstitute the stay, so same-sex couples were able to get married. I think there's still going to be litigation, though. The supporters of Prop 8 are going to try to find some way to argue that, Prop, that Judge Walker's decision is limited to the two same-sex couples who brought the suit. It wasn't a class action suit. It was two couples. He's issued a statewide injunction, but isn't the remedy there much broader than what's allowed if only two couples brought the lawsuit? Now, I think there's a strong argument that no one challenged the scope of the injunction at the time. The supporters of the initiative don't have standing, so they can't be the ones to challenge it. But I predict what we're going to see is some county clerk in a conservative county is going to go to federal court and ask for a declaratory judgment that Vaughn Walker's ruling can be limited only to those two same-sex couples, and then the litigation will continue. So among the other disadvantages of the way the Supreme Court handled this, dismissing on standing and reasoning merits, is I think there's going to still be a lot of litigation. But at least for now, same-sex couples get to marry in California. The effect is the same as if the court had struck, struck down Prop 8. So it's been an amazing year in the Supreme Court, and I've saved about five minutes for questions. Please. One case you didn't mention, which is consistent with most of the Supreme Court's uh, lack of jurisprudence, is the St. John's River case of standing prison. Would you feel comfortable talking about that? Sure. This is the Coons case, the takings case that you're referring to, and it came down a week ago Monday as well. Um, and again, just the nature of an hour was picking and choosing the, the, from the 73 cases. The Supreme Court, in a couple of cases, Nolan and Dolan said, when the government puts conditions on the development of property, the conditions have to be justified by a benefit that's roughly proportioned to the burden imposed. And the question is, what if the government denies a permit to somebody? Does the government still have to meet this test of a taking? And the Supreme Court, five to four, said yes, that the standards for a taking apply even in those circumstances where it's the government denying a permit as well as granting a permit with conditions. It's just going to make it harder for local governments to engage in land use regulation without having to deal with takings challenges. John? Uh, the Voting Rights Act, Section 2. If you were advising the ACLU and its partners on where to file Section 2 challenges to these new uh, restrictions, what would be, do you think, the most fruitful uh, states, cases, issues to take up? Your question is important because I think that the effect of the decision in Shelby County versus Holder is going to mean a lot more Section 2 litigation because all of the plans that otherwise would have been nullified by preclearance being denied now have to be challenged in court in Section 2. Um, and here it's a question of venue that, you know, either you're going to have to have venue in, in that state or in some instances you can get venue in a federal district court in Washington, D.C., but that's it. And usually it's going to have to be in that state. Um, and which ones do you challenge? Obviously you want to go for the ones that you're most able to bring a successful suit against. Um, but the Texas case is almost surely going to have to be brought in Texas. And uh, there, uh, in many of these cases, it will go to a three-judge federal court in, in, in that jurisdiction. Um, but there's one pending right now in Arizona, for example, before a three-judge federal court challenging the Arizona plan. So if I understand the question right, it's generally going to have to be brought in the state where you're bringing the challenge, and then just a matter of looking for which are the ones we have most chance of succeeding under the Section 2. And I've also heard that it will be easier to challenge uh, changes in existing laws that were established to uh, prevent discrimination from challenging new, new schemes. Do you think that's true? I think it's going to be contextual. I think if there's a change that harms minority voters, there's going to be the impression that this was adopted for the purpose of harming minority voters. You don't have to show purpose in order to bring a successful challenge under Section 2. 
The Voting Rights Act was amended in 1982 to allow disparate impact claims against minority voters to be sufficient. So a change helps you in terms of being able to show the underlying reason was to harm, but ultimately it's going to really be about whether it's a change or a new plan. Can you show the discriminatory effect against minority voters? Please. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many Armed Career Criminal Act statutes. Um, and it just, every term seems to have more of them. And uh, it would be great if you see here that the court is doing something that's really a sea shift. I'd wait until next year or the year after and see what they do with regard to it. There's just so many cases in that area. And, they, you know, and, and the, the test, I mean, just to even read the opinion of the modified approach and all that, is just so complicated. Um, but I may be too pessimistic. Any other um, I wonder what you make of the court's choice to take another affirmative action case before it has ruled on Fisher. And relatedly, it feels as though the court is doing some reorientation of equal protection law in the context of race by taking two affirmative action cases and focusing on the harms that majority race populations as opposed to minorities and Shelby County focusing on the harms of states as opposed to racial minorities. Sure. And this, of course, is Mark Rosenbaum's case, the Schuette versus Coalition for Affirmative Action. This involves a Michigan initiative that was adopted, identical to California's Proposition 209, that says that, in this instance, educational institutions cannot discriminate or give preference on the basis of race. Um, Mark came up with the brilliant strategy of arguing that this is a restructuring of the political process in a way that disadvantaged minorities and thus violates equal protection. And though he lost in the district court, he argued in the Sixth Circuit and won. And then the Sixth Circuit en banc, and I think it was an eight to seven en banc ruling, split exactly along the political party lines of the president who appointed the judge to affirm and declare this unconstitutional. Um, I think when you have a court of appeals split eight to seven, exactly along the political parties of the president appointed, that's a good signal the Supreme Court's likely to take the case. Also, the Ninth Circuit had upheld Prop 209, and it just recently reaffirmed that. So there's a split between the Sixth and the Ninth Circuit. There's also a real difference between Fisher and the case that's before the court next term. Fisher is can colleges and universities continue to use race as a factor in admission decisions, and if so, when? The case that's before the court next term says, can the voters in a state prohibit its colleges and universities from considering race as a factor? So it's analytically quite distinct. The only thing that I thought when the court took this case is it showed that they weren't going to eliminate all affirmative action in Fisher, because they truly said the Constitution requires colorblindness, where I think four justices want to go, then that ends affirmative action, and then there's no need to deal with the latter case. So I think it was possible to predict when they took this case that they knew they weren't going to eliminate all affirmative action, which then raises the question, can a state, through its political process, do so? And the case will be argued sometime in the fall. We're out of time. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for having me. Delighted to be with you.